Flashback 4.6 Moral Dilemmas of Biblical Proportions Debriefing and Uniting Fracturing Team We pulled into the hotel and exited Tiny's black van. Bob asked, Hey, can we debrief now? Like, let's go to Richard's room. We can talk and recap everything there. Um, and I figure we are... Figure out what we're going to do forward. Okay? I answered. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We should compare our notes and observations and definitely plan what we're going to do next. It was a harrowing experience. Both Katie and Bob demanded to sleep in Deputy Taylor's room, or mine, saying, if we can kill thugs, they can kill us. Katie used Taylor's own words against her and asserted, you said the team is safer together, safer in numbers, that we were safer not splitting up. I think we should all stay and sleep in the same room from now on. We may even need a rotating lookout, always awake, like they do on TV, guarding and watching out for us while we sleep. I don't want to die, and I'm scared, okay? I don't want to be alone. I smiled and suggested, maybe we should always stay and sleep in one room, as Katie has said to us. Albeit, maybe we rent a penthouse or something bigger in the future so we can have our own beds and all we still be together while we get real rest and comfort. Bob grumbled. Yes, please. He added a nervous, Wah. Katie smiled widely at that, clearly expressing her gratitude of making her idea a reality and not just listening to her, but actually adopting it going forward. She said, yeah, wah. The deputy nodded. Fine, but I sleep alone in my bed. It was clear. If there was a bed, it was her bed. It did not seem fair, but I felt we needed the deputy at all times to be at top of the game. So we all shrugged, looked at each other, and muttered variations of, okay, yeah, whatever, sure, uh-huh. Taylor added, I don't think we need a lookout. Not right now, anyway. There will certainly be times of threat that we will need people on watch. But no one saw or followed us, and the hotel already knows we keep very weird and strange late hours based on our comings and goings. So there's no reason to believe that we are in any more threat now than we were last night or the night before that. And we need our rest. So just go to sleep. We'll figure things out tomorrow. The deputy seemed to issue a recognition of Katie's anxiety, though, with a tilted head, shake, and half a smile. It offered a strange reassurance that she was there and confident in our safety. Deputy Taylor instructed us, Although I do not think we need a lookout, just like we will share a room in the future for safety, you should all keep your Bowie knives close, but in its scabbard. You don't want to cut yourself while you're asleep. I'll keep my zombie blade on the bedstand next to me, unsheathed. I know how to wake up and grab it. I have a lot of practice. It's safe for me. Bob said, Sure, I love sleeping with knives. His voice trailed off with a, Why not? It was apparent that Bob may be regretting his decision to join me on this adventure. I turned to the team, seeing Bob's unnerved and potentially infectious negativity not ending without some kind of intervention. So I said, Look, it is probably too late for any of us to bail now. Quitting, I paused would just remove the safety in numbers group thing that we all just agreed was imperative. Breaking off from the team is not a good idea. Not at least until we know what we're dealing with. At least that's what I think. Again, I stated it clearly. It was clear that emotions and anxieties were running high across the team. I said, look, we were all there. 
We are all accomplices in the murder of two people. Yeah, it was murder. Regardless of their probably being devil worshippers and cultists and threatening the deputy with guns. Maybe it was self-defense. But it was probably at best provoked conflict that resulted in self-defense homicide. After we trespassed and broke and stole property. Ex-Special Operations Deputy Taylor looked down and then upward, almost to heaven, and said, We were on a mission. Heck, we were on a mission for God. It is not murder when soldiers eliminate enemies, especially when that opponent intends harm or death to them. They intended to harm or kill me, and I am never prepared to let someone else decide when I live or when I die. Never. And so no, I defended myself in a military mission for God style. Spec Ops Taylor underscored her message. I always see this. Civilian shock over necessary acts of a soldier. The bad guys don't follow a no harm, no kill doctrine. They follow the opposite. Kill anything that remotely threatens you. And hey, I was a threat. You were all threats. They would not hesitate to kill all of us. She hammered the hotel room desktop where she was seated and loudly commanded, You need to get used to killing. That's it. She added, We saw tonight... These guys are deadly serious. These guys are armed. Allegedly, these guys worship the devil. Has anyone ever heard of human sacrifices? They're the bad guys. Bad guys are bad guys. They earned their right to atone for their sins and I'm merely helping them along their way just a little faster maybe than they wanted. She grinned. They need to die and let God decide if they will go to hell or not. And I feel good that I have only ever killed for just right reasons. Wow. Deputy Taylor had a very ruthless, even callous side when it came to missions or anything military. Anything involving life and death. So I concluded. But she also seemed to have a clear defined code that defined the appropriate situations to end someone's life. It was black and white, ruthless, but effective. We needed effective. We needed Deputy Taylor. Of course, I think the deputy was right. Good does not triumph without defending itself. It may have to protect itself proactively, taking initiative to protect good from evil. Evil plots, so good must be ever watchful and vigilant and proactive. Katie blurted, But thou shalt not kill. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Bad people kill, and they go to hell, she said almost teary-eyed. We could all be damned to hell for just trying to stop this cult. I could be damned to hell. We all need to pray for forgiveness. Bob looked sympathetic to Katie. I don't know about us going to hell or not, but prison is a very real possibility. We need to get our stories straight. Reading the room, there was no consensus on murder or self-defense, much less what we should do about it. And everything for that matter. The team was falling apart. It was fracturing. I tried to reassure the team. This is all crazy. It is new to all of us. Deputy Taylor has the most experience. We should listen to her. I believe in her. She will keep us alive and successful. When I consider myself the Ten Commandments or the Bible or Old or New Testaments, I think there has been killing of people in the name of God and Christianity throughout history. 
I mean, think about it. The Crusades were all about convert or die. I mean, that was precisely what the deputy was talking about. The Knights for God were soldiers. They were not murdering people. They were protecting and evangelizing Christianity and the Word of God. Willful killing of a person for personal gain, vengeance, jealousy, your own purpose. Well, that's murder. No doubt about it. But killing someone accidentally, we all know that's manslaughter. We don't consider that murder. Though a person died. So why is it wrong for us as God's soldiers to kill enemies of the good and righteous? I say no, it's not wrong. There is no hell for the righteous. Katie asked, um, do you think it's still a good idea to meet in person and offer a buyout settlement? I mean, now I think they may do terrible things to us, right? No? She looked very nervous and unsure. I replied, we need to give them the chance. It is still the right thing to do. Just because we are scared now does not change the reasoning that we thought before that made it make sense. We need to give them a chance to do the right thing. Bob snarled. Do the right thing? After we killed two of their people? Come on, Richard. That's not how humans behave. Their will want vengeance. They will want revenge. They will want something that they will perceive as payback. They want justice, I'm sure, from their perspective. It's only human. He added, Now, if they do not value life, do not care about two of their own dead, it's still bad, but we could negotiate maybe then, if we have something to negotiate with, of course. I'm not convinced making an offer will end well for us, Richard. The deputy said, there is no evidence that it was us. There is no proof that we were there. It was a mission. What happens in a mission stays with the mission. You forget, you move on, forget and move on. She added, I cleaned up the scene while you came down the ladder. Just remember, we were all here talking about tourism plans. Any contradicting proof, deflect and deny. I then added, but I don't lie, deputy. I cannot lie. I will not lie. I have never lied, at least not knowingly, and I will die before I will knowingly lie. Deputy Taylor looked at me and said sarcastically, great, you don't lie, how admirable. She was not pleased, in fact, with my integrity, it seemed. Okay, Richard, he who will not lie, Use your brilliant mind and deflect then. Just do not admit anything ever. I nodded in agreement. It was late and no one wanted to deal with the hotel concierge to get some kind of roll away bed, cots, or even blankets for us to sleep in the same room. So Bog suggested, hey, Let's go get our blankets, pillows, and luggage from our rooms and bring them back here to Richard's room. We can all camp out in Richard's world going forward, he joked, then added, okay, about room assignments, as in where are we gonna sleep? Deputy Taylor gets the bed. As agreed, she needs to have her combatant beauty rest. How about we rock paper, scissors for who gets the couch and who gets the bathtub, and I guess the floor. Anyone can have the floor, I suppose, is wide open or last choice. Does that work for everyone? Katie said, count me out. I'll just sleep on the floor. 
I will bring all my hotel's blankets and make myself a big doggy bed sheet pile to sleep on for myself. You can fight over the tub and the couch. Yep, that left the tub and the couch between Bob and me. I have always wanted friends and colleagues to view me as an ally that they would march into hell for, alongside, because they trust and know me to be a good, smart, wise, and righteous person, and because I always win. But I also realized I needed the team to be willing to march into hell for each other, not just me. We needed a true, deep trust and reliance on each other. Building trust, to me, starts with knowing the other person has your best interests at heart and in mind. All I could think in the moment was to choose the least desirable place for myself, the bathtub. I figured giving the better place to sleep was a very small but literally impactful thing to do for the team. I was taller than Bob and thus would fit worse in the bathtub than Bob probably would have. But I decided to take one for the team, like I have always done throughout my life. So I said, you take the couch, Bob. I sold the decision on the safety that the bathtub offered to me sleeping in it having walls on all sides. I said specifically, you know the tub is a safe place and it's the most secure in the entire room and hotel. Because, well, you got walls on all sides and you're in a room that has no window, just a bathroom door and it has its own ventilation. So quite literally, you're surrounded by steel in your own protective panic chamber. So again, Bob, you can have the couch. Please take it. I'm fine in the bathroom in my protective tub. I felt like a bit of a hero giving up the couch. I was sacrificing my good rest, but I did feel it was the right thing to do for the team. Bob said, great, that works for me. Just for transparency, the bathtub is also the only place there is no escape or way out from. It could be a trap. It's like being backed in a corner. Not many ways to get at you, but no way for you to get away either. Deputy Taylor grinned. No way out is a kill box. I'll make sure no one gets to you in the bathroom. She chuckled. In the bathroom. Once more, we finally settled in within a few hours of dawn. We tried to sleep restlessly and had bouts of rest, but not even an hour of contiguous sleep. We slept to the afternoon, ordered room service for a liner, aka lunch dinner, and we slept afterwards through the next night into the following morning, rested and ready to go and meet the cultists and the owner of the Hanging Albatross Pub and Scary Little Things Curio Shop. We were off to meet Brocco McDema.